So here's a metaphor. Imagine, you know, 1,000 puppies in a, in a giant mansion. It's pretty cute, no? They're just running around. Look at them. <laughs> but then imagine this. There are these nasty security guards who are just cordon off each room, and they don't let the puppies go from one place to the other. So this is, this is the kind of the, the way the mind is set up. Uh, if, the mind is not frag if the mind is not fragmented, then the puppies, our thoughts really, uh, and their desires and beliefs and so on, they just roam around freely. They, there's a certain kind of access to everywhere. Whereas if your mind is fragmented, then there are certain parts of your mind that are just sealed off. And there's just no communication between some parts of your mind and some, par some other parts of your mind. Uh, things are kind of information, desires, beliefs are put away in this kind of faraway fragments and kept there by this nasty security guard. So I'm sure that you can now see what's good here and what's bad here. So not fragmented is good, fragmented is bad. So the idea is that mind can be fragmented, in which case there's no uh, information flow from certain parts of the mind to certain other parts of the mind. Um, and if your mind is fragmented, then there will be desires that will conflict with your self-image. And then if you get into a tempting situation, then you're going to act on it, and you're going to find it difficult to, to resist that temptation. But if, if your mind is not fragmented, then, you're, um, then that means that there's, uh, your, your various desires are in tune with each other, and they're in tune with what you think of yourself. And this straight self-control that I've talked about, this measure, is really what, it's, what it measures. What, it's, what it reflects is the degree of your fragmentation of your mind. So I think that the fragmentation of the mind is a really important thing, independently of the whole temptation stuff. So I'm going to uh, try to say a little bit more about fragmentation and then come back to the, um, to the temptation business at the end. So here is one really bad news that I have to break to you at the beginning. Um, it's, uh, we're kind of screwed in the sense that uh, that fragmentation, uh, there are a lot of kind of systemic reasons why fragmentation is the norm and not the, not the exception. So all of our minds are, they tend to be more on the fragmented side than on the non-fragmented side. And I'm going to give you three reasons for that. One of them is, which I take to be the most important one, is that we change. All of us, we change a lot. And most of the time, we change in a way that we don't notice. So two very quick examples, one of them is the mere exposure effect. So if you're exposed to a certain stimulus, whatever stimulus it is, it's going to, just by being exposed to it without any explanation, it's going to make you like that kind of stimulus more. So if you're exposed to a certain kind of face or a certain color, that's going to make you like that stimulus more. And, and it, it's also music. So if you're ex exposed to a certain kind of music, that's going to make, that, make you like that music more. So maybe you're a, uh, you're a fan of early music, um, but you go to the mall, and you, you're doing your shopping, and there's Justin Bieber on, uh, on. That, just by being exposed to that, that's going to make you like Justin Bieber a little bit more. Uh, and it happens in such a way that you're not aware of that. So mere exposure effect, the mere exposure can happen unconsciously. So that's one way in which we change in the way that we don't notice. Another way, and that I think is, is really depressing, uh, is about frustrated desires. So um, we, all, we all have, we all want things that we don't get, right? I mean, that happens. So, uh, so you, you have a desire that gets frustrated, then two things happen. You uh, want that thing more, but when you achieve it, you like it less. The want it more is not very surprising, right? Uh, because we are always, uh, you know, if you fail at something, we just want it more, we really want to get, want, want to get that. But when you're actually going to get it, because of the previous frustration, you're going to like it less. And there's beautiful experiments that, uh, that demonstrate this. So what, what, what follows from this is that if you want something and you're, and you're not and you're kind of consistently not being able to get it, then you're not going to be able to enjoy it. You're going to, something that you clearly care about because you want to do it is going to give you very little pleasure when you actually achieve it. So you're trained to do the marathon and you, you really want to do it under three hours and you just can't. Um, and you know, it's always three or five or three or four. And then finally you do it. And then you're, you're, because of your previous failures, you're not going to enjoy it that much. You're going to like, huh, okay. <laughs> and that's not what you want. I mean, you know, you change your diet. You change your whole daily routine because of that. And then what, what are you going to get out of this? So it's sad. All right. So we change a lot. And there's a, a very nice um, experimental um, evidence for that is at the end of history illusion that measures the, um, the amount of change people anticipate in the next 10 years 
compared to the, the change that they underwent in the last 10 years. And, they, and people consistently underestimate the change that will happen to them. So we consider ourselves to be the finished product. That's the end of the road for us. You know, we used to be very different, but who I am now, that's, that's what I'm going to be in 20 years. And that's just false. That's blatantly false.